Hello everyone, I'm Arthur Champeau from France, and I'm really honored to be with you virtually today. Um, I have to apologize, I couldn't make it to um, the event since I am currently in France for my PhD. And uh, I want to give a special thank to the Odyssey team that organized this event and to uh, Mr. Tree that was always there to help me and uh, that um, hosted me when I was an uh, intern. I Odyssey. So uh, today I want to talk about the cybersecurity legal framework. Um, it's a large topic, and I uh, I try to be uh, short, concise, and uh, and clear in my explanations. Um, I will show you a document. Uh, so I share my screen, so you can see what I'm talking about. And uh, so. So for this topic, I, uh, I choose to talk about a cybersecurity legal framework um, as um, I want to introduce this uh, concept through the international, regional, uh, and local perspectives. So uh, you'll see that uh, I, I am going to go through um, the different levels later. Uh, you'll, you'll see how it is on the slides. Um, so as a contemporary society increasingly relies on digital grounds, cybersecurity threats progressively became a strategic aspect of development on every level. Even if it used to be a residual danger in the past, um, used mostly between bigger actors and uh, industrial spying or military maneuvers, the demo democratization of the internet broadened the horizon for hackers. As of today, um, individuals, companies, and states are growing concerns protecting assets and people, people's privacy. Consecutively, the different actors develop their own fences and build uh, standards to face this new challenge. Citizens' trust is not sufficient um, to, to peaceful exchange in the digital world. Um, although stability and predictability are essential to growth, Systems are then adapting through the edification of uh, cybersecurity uh, norms. Consequently, if every actor part of this chain of exchange is compelled to apply increasingly sophisticated protections to both oneself and thus to protect the network. In an era of permanent presence of technology and interconnection, everyone is continuously affected. The world is in a period of rapid change where digitally technology, digital technology has been used to communicate with each other in all sectors. Digitalization has accelerated economic growth and leapt over some development stages, such as the formulation of every new uh, economic policies or the transformation on, of development goals to the digital industry. This was a quote from the um, National Policy on the Development of Digital Sector, 2030. Uh, that was uh, the work of the uh, Royal um, Cambodian government. Um, and I think it, it's, um, it's a good intro since uh, it underlines the digital sustainable development that has to be seen as a major aspect of economic and social growth in most regions of the world. Um, Khmer government acknowledged this strategic va value for the country's future. Therefore, it, it also became uh, pivotal for the royal kingdom to secure uh, ICT tools in order to preserve the golden market. This would be the main reason why um, cybersecurity is slowly emerging and following the digital growth in the kingdom of Cambodia. Considering now the cybersecurity level of threat in the region, um, a 2016 study showed that the APAC region has 80% more chances to be targeted of cyber attacks since it has um, some weak spots compared to the rest of the world. Um, we can also see on the other side that um, the Asian 
region is the fastest growing digital markets in the world with 125,000 new users accessing the, um, the internet every day, says Interpol. Um, this is also one of the focus of this presentation, uh, which would be led alongside with the analysis of um, the EU cybersecurity security legal framework and institutions, as it is one of the oldest alliance that developed uh, cybersecurity policies as well. So um, the, um, the approach here is to uh, basically compare uh, the level of, it, of advancement from uh, what we can uh, observe in Europe to what, what it's like in the ASEAN uh, region and uh, organization. So we see uh, new technologies uh, can also create new opportunities in cyberspace crime. We will call this uh, cybercrime later on. And um, so we see that whereas legal systems tend to struggle to adapt, well, uh, experts are still debating the precise economical weight of such illegal industry that might uh, generate something between one trillion to one point five trillion dollars just in two thousand and eighteen. Um, notably, with the illegal markets happening on the dark web, this exceeds the global drug trafficking. Um, Furthermore, cybercrime weighs down on society because it's causing billions of dollars of damages each year. That's why I think we want to understand threats, uh, cyber threats, to mitigate, mitigate such phenomena. Uh, but this um, presentation wouldn't go without um, a definition um, slide, as uh, I'm going to introduce you some um, key definitions. Uh, and to start with, I think we uh, we will start with the um, definition of uh, cybersecurity uh, as uh, the art of protecting networks, devices, and data from unauthorized access or criminal use, and the practice of ensuring confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. Not the prism from the ISO uh, ISO uh, IEC. 2072032 um, proposes definition excavating the state of um, preservation of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information in the cyberspace. We see that um, cybersecurity is employed in subnational, national, and transnational contexts, translated in various forms of threats in the digital world. Challenges are incre increasingly important. Thus, the question of cybercrime, cybercrime control became rapidly a strategic field to invest. Accordingly, to these three geographic perspectives, the state level represents sovereignty risks in preserving strategic uh, assets or national security, whereas companies and uh, individuals like us are threatened on economic and or privacy levels apprehended as uh, private interests, but nonetheless fundamental values. Um, so um, I'm afraid now I, I will have to introduce you to a few technicalities, but uh, that are essential to understand uh, what kind of actors are involved in cyber security systems. Um, so implementing cyber security measures signifies uh, different means depending on the financial and expertise available for each level of society, uh, which are um, state, company, and individual once again. Individuals are trying to put, put up with robust passwords, up-to-date system, uh, firewalls, precaution against social engineering. This is what we try to, um, to spread. Um, we, uh, we think it is um, one of the most efficient way to build cybersecurity through awareness of the users. So that's one of the key points of uh, this presentation. And then for companies, uh, depending on their scale and the level of critical critical and informatic infrastructure and um, strategic data, they um, tend to develop cybersecurity guidelines and procedures in prevention or, or for crisis. Um, some companies are hiring experts, subcontractors to handle this imperative. 
Uh, I'm going to give you a few names so you, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm, th I'm thinking um, uh, Maxi, uh, Raytheon, uh, Lockheed Martin, Kapersky Labs, or FireEye to just um, cite the, the main actors on the market. Other companies um, that benefit from larger autonomy, uh, they can create uh, information share, sharing and analysis uh, centers. Um, we, we call them uh, ISACs to, to help critical infrastructure industry players to protect facilities, personal and customers from uh, cyber and physical security threats. Or uh, information sharing and analysis organization is the second name. Uh, so ISOS, um, I, I will show you this. So that you have the acronyms with you. Um, then uh, I think for what what like what comes to the state, um, they tend to consider strategic value on the and the critical aspect aspect of cybersecurity, as in uh, preserving their national interests in conserving a functional system for their own administration as well as for its residents or citizens. Um, thus, the, the state will um, develop specific policies to, threat, to strengthen uh, cybersecurity in cyberspace, um, such as uh, dedicated regulations, along with uh, crisis management uh, procedures, international cooperation, and they can also set up institutions in charge. Uh, so we have like national agencies um across across the world and uh, um well to also give you a few names uh, we have the nsa in the us which might be the most famous one in france we have uh, one that is called uh, ANSI. uh you can see that on the top right of the screen um the national cyber defense center which i think is the uh, the british one uh, Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure, which corresponds to the German uh, one, or maybe the other way around with the British uh, uh, National Agency for um, Cybersecurity. Anyway, uh, these agencies are um, also in charge of raising awareness in, of the different actors or to organize ISAACs along with uh, another um, uh, tool, another um, uh, institution that is very important that is called the uh, computer emergency response teams we call them CERTs um, on the left um, bottom corner of the, the screen uh, we you have um, this uh, uh, type of um, institution organ uh, in Cambodia that is called the CAMCERTs uh, this um, these are the, the operational um, centers for um, cyber threats, and uh, they try to react and uh, to contain um, um, cyber attacks, for example. Um, so the, the CERT coordination center uh, defined these uh, entities as the, the main mission are related to uh, security emergencies, once again. So now to get back on more uh, trivial definitions, um, I think it's important to um, define what uh, cybercrime is uh, as uh, any illegal behavior directed by means or of electronic uh, um, operations that target the security of computer systems and the, the data processed by them. So we have many different types of uh, cyber crimes uh, that are committing, committed every day on the internet, such as the, um, financial crimes, uh, unauthorized access, theft, uh, viruses, worms, uh, distributed denial of service, we call that DDoS attacks, um, then the Trojan uh, horse attacks, um, the webjacking, the cyber terrorism, Cyber pornography, online gambling, IP crimes, email spoofing, cyber defamation, cyber stalking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, well, we have to remind uh, ourselves that uh, some of these cyber crimes are recognized as such uh, in some countries, and in others, it is uh, not so forbidden. Uh, I'm thinking about the online gambling in some countries; it's 
um, something that is uh, illegal and some others it is legal. So we don't have any international norms defining all the, um, the cyber crimes yet, even though we might find some uh, interesting guidelines in the Interpol um, guidelines, for example. Um, now I want to move on to the methodology I, I, I use uh, for this uh, presentation, but uh, um, I also want to mention the fact that this presentation is the fruit, um, is the product of um, uh, a research paper that will be published soon, that is almost ready, uh, with the, pretty much the same title. Um, so here we have a sort of uh, a funnel shaped uh, approach from uh, this international overview to a more uh, regional analysis to end up with the Royal Kingdom of Cambodia uh, assessment of cyber security legal framework. So you can see that we uh, do start with the international regulation and institutions at play. Um, next, uh, next up is the summary comparative approach between the EU and ASEAN uh, to finally um, go on deeper details on the Cambodia as a case study. So uh, I believe this is necessary to understand all the complex links implicated in cybersecurity as a global phenomenon uh, with, with uh, its um, intricate uh, realities. Uh, you see like all these levels are somehow um, um, connected uh, and they respond to each other as Cambodia can be part of uh, ASEAN uh, and um, fight cybersecurity um, on uh, like with this uh, co corporate cooperation uh, approach and uh, ASEAN itself is also um, dealing with other uh, other international institutions uh, and some of them are uh, on the global level, which you will see in a second. So uh, we will get started with the international. Um, level but uh on side note i just uh, i just want to mention that i won't be talking about the, the g8 summits or the council of europe since we have a limited amount of time um in to present this section so this section will mainly be about um uh, these three institutions called the uh, interpol interpol uh, the united nations uh, and nato um You'll see that uh, there's the European Union and the ASEAN right below and uh, Cambodia within the ASEAN. But what I want to show you first is that you see the two types uh, of uh, international organizations dealing with cybersecurity. The first one is, um, I mean, the one that might be most interesting and the most important is obviously the United Nations as it um, encompasses this uh, sort of a global uh, action uh, on um, on cyber security um, basically it um, it takes care of uh, the cyber defense um, in the sense that it tries to uh, work on uh, um, cyber warfares um, and um, to keep peace uh, like word peace and uh, word stability so um, I think it is important to underline uh, this part uh, as it also takes care of the cybercrime issues, specific uh, regulations. And on top of this, um, it also uh, endorses uh, the, um, the work of um, the human rights um, and uh, the privacy of um, internet users. Uh, next up is uh, just a small um, uh, word on the, the fact that we can also see this distinction between. Uh, um, oh, um, I, I forgot to to mention. So Interpol is um, the 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 one international cybercrime uh, um, organization. Um, so it has the the most ex expertise, and uh, all the experts, all the international experts are uh, working with Interpol at some point. Uh, on the other hand, uh, NATO is more uh, related to cyber defenses, uh, cyber defense uh, topics, uh, as it's uh, um, a military alliance uh, in the first place. Uh, the North Atlantic um, um, organization is uh, 
uh, handling uh, cyber warfare procedures. Uh, it creates some um, cyber defense uh, law um, and, um, and cyber conflict laws that are really interesting for the future of uh, um, the, the, the word st stability and, um, and diplomacy. Right underneath, we see that um, European Union also have some sort of global action taking care of the three aspects, namely uh, cyber defense, cyber crime, and, uh, and uh, the human rights and privacy uh, of the internet users, as opposed to ASEAN that is still building cyber defense and, and um, in a sense, um, sort of not avoiding, but uh, the, the human uh, rights um, concerns about uh, um, cyber threats are not really on the table uh, as of now. Uh, also, the cyber crime is sort of handled, uh, but only through cooperation uh, with Interpol uh, um, that we uh, have seen like in the, the recent uh, events. So the main aspects of uh, International cybersecurity uh, policy are um, uh, the complementarity between international institutions. Uh, we see that um, Interpol and uh, NATO are working uh, hand in hand with um, uh, the UN in the middle. Uh, so it's interesting to to have different roles of specification create, creating scope of expertise uh, and, uh, and and then we have international and regional appreciation of cyber threats so they can spread the word about um, and the information about uh, what's new on uh, uh, cyber attacks how can we uh, avoid these how can we combat uh, new threats, how the state can be prepared, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this enhances um, the cooperation between institutions uh, and it creates, uh, and by it's uh, by create, by multiple fora gathering all the key actors. So you see all these international institutions, it's pretty um, um, uh, simple to say this, but uh, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, these uh, international institutions are um, a special place to discuss cybersecurity between actors and uh, it creates uh, some space for uh, diplomacy. Um, so countries can uh, work together on how do we fight um, uh, cyber attacks? How do we fight um, hackers? Uh, what do we want as a rule for uh, um, cyber um, attacks um, when like they want to hack back when they want to fight back with their own tools so overall we can say that um, this um, setup of institutions are creating a sort of uh, global awareness and uh, a circulation of critical information um, <clears throat> uh, although uh, i have to uh, to say that um, there is some limits to this state of things, as we have uh, some uh, stalemated um, diplomatic diplomatic uh, situations that are undermining progression of international norm creation. Uh, what I mean by this is um, we've seen multiple times in the uh, recent uh, uh, discussions and uh, and negotiations. Uh, mostly in um, the UN uh, work groups or, or in the um, uh, General Assembly, that um, it was sometimes hard to find compromise between uh, different countries that um, have like different uh, uh, conflictual interests. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, some uh, really uh, classic um negotiations involving uh, russia with the us or uh, with uh, china uh, even recently and uh, um, we have mil multiple uh, actors uh, state actors that are not keen to find common ground or they just have different views uh, it's also cultural views about what should be allowed to build a common um 
in safe uh, cyberspace. Um, um, on um, uh, well, besides this, uh, we also fear that um, the multiple fora uh, created by this, um, these institutions uh, might create some uh, confusion between all the actors and uh, also between all the norms that are created. Uh, most of them were obviously soft law and guidelines, but uh, it is a risk to have some uh, contradictory uh, international legal uh, provision uh, between these different institutions. It happened in the past, actually. Uh, and you see some propositions from some states that were um, going um, on the opposite uh, direction as uh, some others. And so it creates tensions and uh, and then the, the legal system is a bit uh, um, sh shook by um, all this fuss about legal discussions. Um, and one last issue that I identified is the fact that bigger countries and uh, uh, bigger, bigger countries might be more representative, uh, represented um, in um, these uh, international um, yeah, institutions. Uh, also, strong economies are going to weigh more on uh, smaller, uh, and this might be a problem uh, for the diplomacy, uh, and that also creates some some more tensions. <clears throat> so overall, um, to just say a few words about uh, all these uh, different institutions. <laughs> And uh, what uh, conclusion we can make uh, today about uh, the, the state of things on the international level? Uh, well, my, my work shows that um, these three main international institutions uh, globally adapted to the challenge of cyber threats and uh, they developed specific tools enhancing cyber security. Overall, uh, they bring a certain form of uh, complementarity and in scope of uh, expertise. The UN occupies the most central place as it developed policies in all uh, sections of cybersecurity, from data privacy and human rights uh, um, to cyber defense, and more recently uh, in the uh, cyber community, mostly through uh, the cyber terrorism lens. So uh, these are the main uh, actions or the main goals uh, that are targeted by uh, the UN at the moment. Um, but as I just mentioned before, the lack of uh, consensus is the last uh, in, in the last negotiations led to um, difficult uh, situations and the work of the GGE and the OEWG um, slowed down significantly and uh, the, the states um, uh, don't even have the, the same definition of uh, cyber, cyber security. So there is a long way until we can actually find some uh, actual uh, norms um, uh, regulating the cyber security on the international level. For um, um, regarding NATO, um, it also brings something fundamental uh, to the table, which is the legal framework on cyber defense and cyber conflicts on a state level. level. Um, as I said before, this international public uh, law is uh, well still on construction, and uh, I think it is. Uh, fundamental to see the work of uh, NATO uh, on this topic. Uh, also, on a side note, we have to uh, consider the fact that NATO was kind of uh, revitalized by the um, recent events about uh, cyber threats. You know, it's a strategic uh, factor uh, that we have to think about. Such um, uh, such situation is uh, leading us to um, see NATO um, coming back on the front uh, of the scene. And uh, so we are impatient to see what is coming uh, and uh, if the allies are going to gather around on the table or if 
the, the trust is, uh, is broken or not. Basically, the comeback of uh, NATO um, has been uh, um, waited for a long time. And uh, now we see that uh, since there are tensions uh, uh, growing, especially in uh, Central Europe, with the Ukrainian war involving Russia, there might be some um, ev evolutions that would be notable. Um, now the third inter international institution, uh, namely Interpol, uh, has grown interest and concrete actions in the field of cyber community, helping states uh, in the fight of um, high-tech crimes. Besides that, the international organization is setting out effective legal framework for international cooperation against cyber crimes, which is the pivotal asset of uh, Interpol. We've seen some uh, large scale and joint, joint operations that are illustrating the success of the institution. So um, it seems that uh, Interpol has taken measures of the contemporary threats and it participates to bringing cyber justice. Uh, however, its action can only do so much uh, when comparing to the explosion of cyber attacks happening all across the world. So innovative adaptation and perpetual investments of, uh, in um, cybersecurity are key to keep up with uh, cybercrime, although it seems that the base of these communities, uh, of these commitments, are clearly not competing, uh, one could say. And uh, last word uh, in conclusion to uh, this uh, uh, painting of international institutions and norms we have in front of us. Uh, we, uh, as uh, jurists, have to uh, mention the, the dynamic uh, happening on the international uh, scene is that, uh, like, for when it comes to uh, norms, the fragmentation of cyber norms as they um, may be useful because um, they have. Uh, different processes and they can address uh, different stakeholders. Uh, it, it is really interesting, although the fragmentation is also a problem uh, since uh, it can lead to a lot of confusion and uh, some uh, juridical um, um, gaps. Um, because uh, we might uh, see the impossibility for the, the few international institutions to respond effectively to a cybersecurity challenge because of this. For now, uh, I want to move on to the comparative case studies uh, between the EU and ASEAN. Um, well, just to say a few words, uh, starting with this, uh, um, we'll uh, start with the EU um, that has grown some maturity in the cyber security systems. Uh, the EU cyber security strategy contains uh, concrete proposals for employing uh, regulatory and policy initi initiatives across, across three areas, resilience, operational capacity, and cooperation. Um, so basically we have um, this uh, uh, old uh, EU that forged strong and broad uh, cybersecurity legal framework gathering uh, EU members together. And um, one uh, specific trait of uh, this cybersecurity legal framework is that it's a sector-based approach that constitutes the essence of uh, such uh, legal framework, uh, which uh, we'll see later is uh, both uh, um, synonym of um, efficiency and that could also be troubling because it's once again this multiplication of uh, norms um, and uh, the one last um, um, aspect of the eu uh, i wanted to mention because uh, there'll be plenty more but i think uh, it is interesting to to, to mention that um, the EU has some dedicated and specialized institutions that are developing expertise, uh, spreading awareness, and providing concrete action plans, as you will see in a second. So you see all these um, 
um, cybersecurity institutions uh, uh, such as the European uh, Network and uh, Information Security Agency, um, the ENISA, and, um, and the European Defense Agency, Europol, that is uh, something like uh, the cousin of Interpol, if, if you want. <laughs> Uh, they work together um, a few times already. The, the, the cooperation is working well. Um, also, the EU joint cyber unit that um, would be the the CERTs, the C E R T uh, of uh, uh, European Union, and uh, finally Eurojust that um, is supposed to be bringing justice on cyberspace, which is a, a great um, task. <clears throat> Um, and um, just to mention this, uh, the, the, the few struggles, uh, the, the few uh, key points that are representing the, the strong points uh, on, about um, the EU cybersecurity uh, system and uh, legal framework, we can say that um, there is a widely spread culture of the technologies uh, of internet and its dangers. Um, Internet um, has been democratized uh, way sooner than many other regions. And um, as such, we have um, users that are more uh, aware of the different da dangers on the web. And uh, so they developed a more defensive approach, like since they know the danger, they might find ways to, to uh, be protected. But uh, on the other hand, uh, this is all relative to the state of the art of um, well, cyber security on one end and uh, cyber attacks on the other, uh, which is quite uh, inaccessible for regular people. Um, what I mean by this is, uh, even if you're aware of the danger at some point, you might not be able to just protect yourself if someone really wants to uh, attack you uh, to um, send you uh, cyber attacks in the sense that uh, as a regular person, you don't have the uh, expertise or the, the knowledge um, to or, or the access to technologies that could actually protect you from anything. Um, so this is a limit. I think it's uh, worth mentioning. Also, the EU has this tradition of uh, building strong alliances and is engaged in involved in uh, cybersecurity institutions uh, on the international level. We see the European Union very active in um, the UN, uh, obviously, and then in NATO, it represents more, uh, most of the, 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 the members. Uh, in Interpol, uh, uh, the EU has been working with Interpol for quite a long time. Also, it developed its own uh, local Interpol, Europol, as I just mentioned before. And um, well, the EU is obviously part of the Council of Europe. Uh, also, most of the, the members are uh, part of EU. And uh, I think it's, um, it's really interesting to, to see all these uh, uh, cooperation uh, levels, and uh, especially with the Council of Europe that I have to, to mention here uh, real quick. It's just that uh, this uh, international institution uh, is the only one that created uh, actual um, uh, enforceable and uh, uh, it's um, international law, sorry. Um, it's called the um, Convention of Budapest from 2000. So, and uh, this uh, has to be noted um, since it's the only one that exists so far. It's open to signatures and to ratify if uh, countries want to, want to join even Though they are not part of the Council of Europe, it's possible. It's encouraged, uh, actually, and uh, we see the US that joined, uh, I think Japan as well, uh, and uh, so on. Um, so you can look at this document. I think it's really interesting. It's a good start to uh, understand um, cybersecurity um, on uh, this level. Um, final word is uh, about the EU is, uh, is it a role model for uh, cybersecurity standards? I think the EU showed some uh, maturity in the field. Uh, it has uh, expertise of its own. It's uh, participating to uh, international uh, cooperation and uh, instances. 
um, and uh, it created uh, clear gu guidelines, uh, protocols, procedures to uh, intervene in uh, cases of uh, cyber attacks. And uh, I think it's uh, something to underline uh, the EU made a lot of progress, but uh, we can also say that some countries um, are um, in some regions uh, are really uh, performing uh, um, cyber security systems that might be better than the EU itself. Thing is, we just um, we see a lot of progress in the EU. It has um, great uh, expectations for the future. Uh, the, the path to cyber security to a safer cyberspace is set, and uh, the investment is uh, um, quite uh, um, important. Um, so we have hope to see more and more cooperation and uh, to see the cyber security levels to rise and to be able uh, eventually to, to fight uh, um, cyber threats uh, effectively. Now is the time to uh, talk about the cybersecurity legal framework in ASEAN. Uh, I try to be a bit quicker um, as I'm running out of time. And um, so the ASEAN path to effective cyber cybersecurity legal framework, uh, it's a really interesting topic and uh, it's um, it's very different from what's, uh, what's happening in the EU in the sense that um, it's been only a few years, I mean, the, the, the reflection uh, of uh, cybersecurity in ASEAN, it's been a longer time, but officially um, there hasn't been any um, um, legal documents that were released uh, that are uh, enforcing any uh, legal obligations for um, countries so far. So there, there are like only non-binding legal documents uh, and uh, no operational institution in charge of the cybersecurity. Um, these uh, ten members, uh, ten members, um, showed some willingness to uh, um, to improve cybersecurity levels and, uh, and to raise um, a legal framework uh, for these issues. Although we didn't see much more than uh, this um, affirmation of uh, their willingness to do so. Uh, on the other hand, we have to mention the fact that there have been a few success in cooperation with uh, Interpol. In joint operation uh, based in Singapore, uh, there's uh, this uh, um, center desk uh, uh, based in Singapore that um, caught um, some cyber uh, terrorists uh, and uh, cyber criminals which is um, a great success for uh, the cooperation in the region. Um, just to mention this document uh, from 2000s, uh, I think the e ASEAN framework agreement is uh, uh, something uh, to, um, that is worth mentioning as the Article 5 uh, on Section 1E. Um, states that um, member uh, states shall take measures to promote personal data protection and consumer privacy. Uh, this is an important step for the region. And even though there hasn't been any more um, declaration about this, uh, it is important to, to outline that it has been there since more than 20 years now, but um, we might we can hope uh, that there be like some further work on this topic and for the article 8 um we see that uh, they also mention the awareness from promotion the general knowledge and appreciation of ict particularly on the internet uh, so here i wanted to um outline the the similarities and uh, differences between uh, the two um, uh, the two regional alliances, and uh, once you start with the um, similar similarities, I think uh, it is uh, important to see to observe that uh, there there are some social and economic disparities between members in both sides, in both um, organizations which can be a factor of uh, slowing down the, the progression for cybersecurity, obviously, because countries don't have the same um, 
um, financial uh, uh, possibilities, capacities. Uh, the two regions also um, both showed uh, their strong willingness to develop international cooperation and invest in world stability, which is a great sign for, for the future, but also it uh, reminds us that uh, the challenge is before us. Um, cybersecurity is fragmented between multiple fields, um, which means that, uh, well, as for the European uh, Union, we see that they, they, they are like multiple regulations that it's uh, beginning to be a little bit confusing for uh, people that are not um, aware of all this, uh, uh, this, this field. It's really hard to approach when you don't know much about this. Uh, same for uh, uh, ASEAN that do, don't have uh, that have, doesn't have a, a one uh, like a, a unique um, document talking about all the different challenges uh, within the cyber security and legal framework, which is also quite normal because the, the the work is tremendous and it would be hard to encompass all the different um, threats and challenges about uh, this. Um, this topic. Uh, cybersecurity is pivotal for market growth. Uh, and uh, we see uh, that um, all region, the two regions consider that, um, well, peace, safety, and stability are key, uh, are keys to uh, have uh, um, economic development that is sustainable. Uh, moving on to the differences, uh, I think, uh, one major difference is uh, that human rights protections are um, now more balanced uh, within the cyber security legal framework in the EU, uh, as it also un um, understands uh, that we need um, privacy for individuals uh, to be balanced uh, against uh, cyber security, uh, against uh, cyber crime or uh, cybercrime laws or cyber um, defense laws. So the individual is not forgotten as opposed to what we can see in the ASEAN that uh, human rights are not really on the table for the moment. Um, the EU is um, obviously an older and uh, older uh, um, organization. It's, uh, it has a, like a greater number of, uh, of members and alliances um, so far. Um, obviously, the EU invested more money in cybersecurity programs um, as of today. Um, and um, it's, uh, I think, my, the main reason is uh, uh, it's also because it has uh, some uh, strategic views. Um, it's a strategic priority for the EU uh, that set clear guidelines. Um, and uh, the EU also benefits from the fact that it has a single market. And uh, as such, uh, with the single market regulation, it can organize it's, uh, it can organize uh, a lot of uh, common work together, like the, the forum of discussion. The, the European Parliament is uh, um, a very important organ that is uh, taking care of the cybersecurity issues, for example, which is something we don't see in uh, ASEAN yet. Now is the time to talk about Cambodia. So finally, so you see Cambodia within uh, ASEAN also plays its own uh, role and uh, develops its own uh, regulations on cyber security. So um, just a few words on, uh, on the context here to remind us uh, how it's done in Cambodia so far. Um, Cambodia's security level remains one of the weakest in the region as shown in the National Cyber Security Index. Ranking Cambodia in the 128th position, bottom of the list. Um, indeed, both regulations and infrastructures in Cambodia are representing latent issues, uh, undermining cybersecurity as they are clearly lacking resources to be effective. Not to say that they almost do not exist so far. Um, overall, the most targeted sites by hackers are government websites such. Uh, such those of uh, ministries, government agencies, and other high-ranking government officials. These are 
uh, usually sub subject to um, SQL injection and DDoS attacks. The Cambodian government experienced attack from groups uh, such as the Black Hat teams from team from Iron, uh, the the Anonymous, the Young Geek Brother team in Will Crew. Um, so the list continues, but um, the first cyber attacks they have been reported in 2002, targeting uh, government websites. Uh, so we have seen this uh, happening on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as the, the ones from the National Election Committee, the National Police, the military, and the Supreme Court. Um, so there have been some uh, filed, files that were leaked about uh, officials. Um, so these are the common issues, uh, uh, including uh, uh, web defacement, phishing, hacking, email hijacking, telecom fraud, and fraud money transfer. Uh, but um, just to, <laughs> to reassure you a little bit, this happens in every country. Uh, this is the case for most of the countries in the world. Uh, no one is uh, safe uh, from uh, cyber threats uh, today. So it's nothing specific about Cambodia. What is specific, on the other hand, is that um, the, there are only a few regulations and policies uh, that are uh, organizing the, the cyber defense, the cyber security overall. Um, so in fact, uh, we see uh, cyber security issue uh, poorly answered comparatively to uh, the threats uh, happening today. Additionally, uh, in the current state of the Khmer society, it is clear that most people in Cambodia are lacking awareness regarding um, cyber security issues, which became a, a crit critical point um, that experts uh, uh, alleged in the past. So here is the legal framework in Cambodia. On the left is um, are the, the laws that are um, uh, in effect at the moment. Uh, just to say a few words uh, about this, uh, they don't really um, answer the challenge of uh, de defining uh, um, key definitions such as, such as uh, cyber security, cyber attacks, cyber crime. Uh, or uh, cyber defense so far. Uh, also, there have been some uh, uh, concerns about um, some uh, legal provisions in the the last um, in the last um, laws in the sub decree, as the international internet gateway uh, is threatening the the freedom of speech. Uh, this has been. Uh, uh, outlined by many N NGOs, uh, locals, and, and international ones. Um, also, mostly we see that uh, the subject decree 252 is giving a lot of power uh, for the central states, the, the, the government to use data, which is great for research and uh, it can make a lot of uh, things move forward. But on the other hand, there is no limits and uh, uh, there, there are concerns about responsibility and, uh, and damage repair in case of uh, uh, data um, violation, personal data violation. Uh, and on the right, you can see um, the future leg legislations that we are waiting impatiently. Uh, they are in progress. So the, the first one is the cyber crime code draft. Uh, well, the, the, the latest versions uh, are not public yet, but uh, we have uh, some from 2017 that uh, is really interesting. Uh, but also threatening um, um, individual rights. So we have to see the, the official, um, uh, the, the, the latest uh, versions um, soon to be sure of uh, um, the, the legal effects it's going to take. Also, there have been announcements about uh, cyber security law and data protection law, which would be the main pillars of uh, cyber security tomorrow and privacy. Um, so the, the observers are uh, um, quite critical about how it's going to be done. Also, uh, to be completely honest, uh, these regulations might take some time to, to come. 
um, has uh, officials um, actually already declared that for the data protection law that it might take at least five more years uh, for the text for the legal text to be released um, which is a lot and um, in the meantime uh, there, there are no uh, privacy uh, protection uh, in the legal landscape of Cambodia which is quite quite a concern so um, this was for the hard law part uh, on the other side uh, we have uh, also plenty soft laws uh, on cyber security which is really interesting because I think these are the ones that are taking the lead on the topic and uh, this is what we have to analyze I actually worked on this in the paper uh, I mentioned before and uh, well if you want to know more about this because this takes a lot of time uh, you can see the the, the details uh, in this paper but uh, basically these are giving guidelines uh, important step for the country to to evolve towards a safer um, cyber space and uh, uh, it creates institutions that are uh, in charge of uh, um, creating uh, new uh, dynamics and uh, to implement uh, uh, and spread uh, the, the, the knowledge about uh, cyber issues. So in terms of uh, awareness, this kind of document is, uh, is actually great. Uh, well, on the condition that it has to um, go, it has to go with uh, concrete actions. Um, just to mention the cybersecurity cooperation aspect of uh, things in Cambodia. Well, Cambodia has been part of uh, ASEAN for a, for a long time now, um, for a few years at least, and uh, uh, it has been an active member uh, that. And then uh, ASEAN is also working closely with Interpol. So this is the um, cooperation on the international level, which is not a lot, but still it's uh, worth mentioning. And uh, what is also important to, to, to notice is that there's been, there's been some uh, bilateral cooperation and some bilateral uh, discussion ongoing about cybersecurity uh, with a um, few countries um, such as Japan, South, South Korea, Malaysia, and the United States of America. Um, well, in conclusion to all this, uh, I think uh, cybersecurity is definitely a burning topic requiring every actor in modern society to step up, uh, to step up and to stay up to date as a perpetual quest for safety for a numerical society. Um, Uh, there, there, there are uh, some um, problems remaining in, uh, in uh, Cambodia, but there are also some uh, solutions that we can, uh, can think about. And uh, here are some thoughts uh, that I want to bring to the table. The first one, and uh, I hope it's going to please the, the ODC team, it's because uh, of uh, its name and its uh, main goal. It's uh, the solution to... Uh, to raise awareness through uh, open data and so it spreads the knowledge about cybersecurity. Uh, then um, another uh, thing to think about is uh, to improve cooperation within uh, the civil society uh, to achieve development goals and build a safety realm so it can uh, allow um, exchange and uh, market growth. Another um, key point of this is to also develop uh, watchdogs to preserve freedom uh, information flow. Um, um, as I mentioned before, um, cybercrime laws and, uh, and others uh, have been criticized in Cambodia because uh, they might be, they are threatening uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and uh, as you must uh, know, as you are journalists, for a lot of you, um, this is a big concern for for the for the profession, for NGOs, for in, for the international community as well. So, on the road to fight cybercrime, Cambodia shows some strong willingness in favor of surveillance and control. 
On the other hand, it is noticeable that individual rights are quite left behind, which could lead to a very difficult situation regarding freedom of speech, uh, freedom to access the internet, and so on. Compromises um, should be found to preserve uh, residents of the kingdom of uh, cyber insecurity and still to be able to participate as free citizens in the life of the country. Um, but there are some strong hopes uh, coming from the international influences and a potential national data protection regulation uh, coming in a few years. A um, few words on the role of the NGOs, though, because I mentioned them um, several times. I think this is important to, to underline. Uh, we see the open development um, Cambodia uh, NGO that is working by uh, organizing this event, for example. This is a great example for uh, raising awareness. You can see a lot of work um, uh, coming from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, just seems to, uh, but also some international organizations such as uh, Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch. So here is a, a very simple formula uh, to uh, raise uh, to raise standards for uh, uh, cybersecurity and to obtain uh, effective cybersecurity and prosperous digital economy. Um, this um, ingredients on the left uh, have to be understood as uh, well, key points, uh, strategic uh, aspects of uh, improving cyber security, uh, improving uh, cyber security legal framework as well. Well, now I want to thank you for your attention. It has been a little bit long. I hope I didn't lose everybody. and. Uh, a real pleasure to, to be among you, even if it was virtually. Um, I want to thank again the ODC team, and uh, I hope you have a, a pleasant um, event with ODC.